Welcome back to Network Spotlight. I am your host, Mikhail. For those that don't know me, I am the founder of Network Spotlight Elites, which is a community of VCs and founders in Web3. Uh, I also have this YouTube channel where I provide a platform for entrepreneurs to be able to educate their community about what it is that they are building. On today's show, I will be talking to Ryan of CyberConnect, which is a social graph protocol that aims to give users ownership and utility of their social graph data. It offers a Web3 social graph module for developers. CyberConnect is also powering Link3, which is a Web3 native social platform built on top of CyberConnect protocol. Lots to go over. I think you'll enjoy the show. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video, show support for our founders, and let's begin. Welcome to the show, Ryan. It's uh, nice to uh, finally connect. I know we've worked before in the past together, but it's it's nice to actually put a face on a name and uh, have an opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with you. I know you've been busy with uh, Cyber Connect. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, what is Cyber Connect? Yes. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me here. Cyber Connect is a social graph protocol where we want to give back the data sovereignty to users. And that kind of enables developers to prepare for mass adoption and network effect in within this uh, social space where they can build on top of those social connections, social data, to enable their applications to be more uh, engaging. So why why is the social aspect of Web3, why is that so important? Well, a couple of things. Well, one thing that it comes from my background, I've been working in social for, for quite a while now. Um, I've been, my last two startups are all also in the Web3 uh, web social space. Um, I think one biggest reason why social is really important at this moment is a lot of a lot of uh, technological transitions happen when people actually like when the tech hits massive scale. Um, like DeFi is really fun, however, it only touches those amount of users that care about trading, that care about speculating. Um, it's it's kind of similar, but back in the day when like mobile was this, was just beginning, where people were designing a lot of e-commerce t- stuff. But what really brought like e-commerce to mass adoption is actually those social elements. Like what Facebook and Instagram actually took off, like everybody now are on a different platform that that is just widely adopted. And then the the other aspects those technology brought can be like spread out a lot faster. Um, I, I think this is what we observed before. And now I think social can really onboard a lot more users into Web3 in general, and then they can start doing all kinds of stuff that's already being played out like uh, DeFi, like NFT communities. Um, and at the same time, I think social in general has been very, uh, ha- we have seen like a lack of innovation in social or like a lot lack of trust as well. People always talk about how they are not comfortable with sharing all the data, uh, how they are not able to really see new innovation or new applications come around where they can enjoy a better uh, better user experience. Like they are actually literally stuck with the same application they've been using for at least 10 years now. Like let's say Instagram or, or Facebook, it's more even more than 10 years. So yeah, just a diff- all kinds of different directions that all points back to like, I think this is the right moment to do it. Uh, either for like Web3 onboarding or for like, like this traditional social networks in general, I think they need something new to, um, to bring more uh, innovation into the space. You mentioned that prior to CyberConnect, you've, um, you've started uh, two different companies all around like social like community. Can you tell me a little bit about those uh, startups and where did you leave off with them? Yeah, so I started my first startup 2013, 2013, 2014, which was uh, in, into social. Back at the time, we, I, uh, a group of my, my friends were, uh, our co-founders were, were thinking, everybody is posting just nice photos on Instagram, posting those like, uh, 
either highly filtered photoshopped uh, nice photos of their them doing like adventure stuff or they're showing off their 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 workout out and all kinds of stuff they're just very a uh, small aspect of people and there doesn't really look that real and it creates like a strong barrier for anyone to post stuff or interact with their with their friends so what we did was like was what was pretty much like be real but back in 2013 and 14 so people had to post something more natural more spontaneous and like they have to interact like they turn on both cameras to turn to take a selfie as long as as well as like a photo of someone they're hanging out with that was back in 2013 14 um i exited uh, earlier but then the, the company still went on and it's, i think they're still working on uh this in the same area and my recent company like my last company was called uh, lino network and dlive uh, which we folk we were targeting content creators and helping them monetize better through crypto uh, it was back in 2017 and we were we built everything. We built our own blockchain on Cosmos to support the kind of transaction that we want, like the the specific transaction for content, like when people create a post, when people donate on a post, when they subscribe to a post or subscribe to a content creator. Uh, those transactions all happen on chain, especially those monetary ones, like the donations. And then we have a um, incentive model or like the token inflation model where there is a content reward that's rewarded to the best uh, best monetized content. It's like giving out block rewards, but but based on how the contents are perceived. Um, I think the the thing that we did really was interesting was um, we had PewDiePie as our streamer. So PewDiePie was and it still is the top YouTube streamer or YouTube YouTuber on the planet. And PewDiePie in twenty nineteen did an exclusive deal with us streamed a, a whole year on, on DLive and we had more than a day, uh, 1, 1 million daily active and we onboarded about like 30 million people into a Cosmos based wallet and we transact more than a couple millions every every month at the time and that company got got acquired but the, the big uh, got acquired by BitTorrent by the way um, the biggest takeaway from that is we we saw we saw like how content creators especially YouTubers and, and streamers, they only get like 30% of whatever that's going through the platform on Twitch or, or YouTube. At most, they can get like 50 or 70 if they're like a huge partner. But we see the monetization problem and the distribution problem where a lot of them are getting the, uh, these, uh, uh, their, their channel getting getting uh, canceled. Like back, back at the time, um, there's like doctor disrespect or like, these are the old days, but we've seen this problem and we tried out in a crypto way and it worked really well in, in that extent. And we helped support a lot of uh, smaller creators that are in like Venezuela, in Turkey, then they can get a global audience by uh, taking those uh, donations and subs subscriptions from uh, not only just from their own country, but from a global audience through through a, 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 the, the, the the blockchain that we design. So they don't have to transact in those uh, banking system but instead directly on chain but yeah that was the that was the two experience that led us somehow let me somehow to creating cyber connect interesting okay so so that was like your first dive into crypto and then from there you said hey you know i think that we can make this an even better solution right and then you jumped into creating cyber connect yes Yes. Um, yeah. Just a little background on cyber kind of, So 20, 2012, uh, 2021, 2020, 2021, we, like I, I, uh, my last company got acquired. Uh, we were just pl uh, playing around and just observing Web3 or like back uh, DeFi summer from the, from the outside and just dabbling into it. One biggest observation was a lot of stuff happened on a lower, like a lower protocol level, but, but on top of a, a common computing, which is uh, most likely a EVM compatible compute environment, uh, which is very different from what we did before. Right, we built our own blockchain on Cosmos, which had, we had our own uh, validators, and it's like not a gener gen generic or generalized uh, computing environment. And you don't have a lot of interaction with other uh, other third party developers. So that's how we take a part of what we built before. Um, 
And we want to just focus on building a social graph that, that, that is like a common data layer for developers to build on and leverage, leverage the same EVM that people are already familiar with to, to provide an infrastructure for developers to build and for users to own their data. Just focus on that kind of layer instead of building out everything like what we did before. Do you th do you see a future where you could potentially like expand like beyond just EVM? Because you know you obviously have experience uh, within Cosmos. Like, what are your thoughts on what's happening on that side of the uh, crypto world? Um, I wouldn't say I have I have the most up to date up to date uh, information about non EVM chains anymore. Uh, I still yeah I'm still ob observing like uh, Solana and Cosmos. Uh, however, I think it's more about the like, developer community where they have this uh, shelling point. Like if people, if people all come to EVM, then uh, no matter the, the like, there's different problems with EVMs, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll stick to EVMs for now and expand into Solana and, and Cosmos when, when when time allows. So uh, let's let's talk about Cyber Connect in a little bit more detail. Like, what are some of the features that people can expect when they when they use this platform? Uh, and uh, I have a few other questions that I want to ask about like mainstream uh, social platforms, uh, since you have a lot of knowledge about that. But let's just start with the uh, some of the features that we can expect from CyberConnect. Yeah, I'm sorry I spent so much time on my past experience. So CyberConnect really, uh, what well, it is a social graph protocol. So what 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 that entails is really providing all the infrastructure for developers to build a full fledged social application. So what, what is like normally a social network or social platforms are content feeds or communication platforms where uh, everything is surrounded around like user identity or user profiles, right? Like you sign up for a new social platform, you, you, you either sign up for a new account, filling out your data, your, 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 your bio description, your interests, and then you start interacting with other people through content through community posts, through all kinds of, uh, or, or, or sometimes through messaging. And then that, that user to content or user to user kind of relationship uh, is what really makes those uh, social platforms valuable. And they can leverage those data to do other stuff or, or empower other, uh, other platforms. Um, CyberConnect is trying to build that data layer in a self-sovereign way. So users own their own data. So nobody else can forge any data or nobody can um, take away the access to their data when they want to export. Like when I want to export my Facebook friends to a different applications, there's currently no way to do that. Um, so CyberConnect itself is really trying to provide that data layer that's publicly accessible and really follows the, the, the owner, the, the user, sign up. So you imagine when you log into any platform, you can directly log in with your CyberConnect profile and then you don't have to fill in any other information and your followers, your friends, uh, your previous contents are always available in a different application. And then th those applications can sometimes skip the bootstrapping period where, oh, these users already are very um, uh, profile rich and then they have all their relationships stored on chain and then those those applications don't need to like bootstrap the the, the co start the co start period where they have to like ask you to onboard all your, your friends all those kind of stuff and because it's on chain all the contents are monetizable and they are they're already tokenized you can set up rules that's running in our middleware so you can monetize your your content by allowing people to mint a copy or collect a copy of your content or in other ways, like you can set up some uh, crowdfunding, uh, crowdfunding uh, content where you want people to you want to raise funds directly, or you can create communities around how only these kind of people can subscribe to me. Like only the let's say if you want to create a board ape yacht club community, you want to set up a profile that only allows um, people with the board ape to subscribe to you, and you can create exclusive content that only does your subscriber, those uh, uh, ape holders can view those content. So it, it really enables on-chain programmability and monetization through through this uh, also shared data, data base that's being used by different applications. 
um, to put them into specific words. So there is the cyber kind of CC profile, what, what we call the so cyber kind of profile. Everyone owns a profile, which comes with a username, come, uh, comes with uh, the basic metadata and also avatar. And then there is the social graph. That's, that's a set of smart contract that ties those data back into a profile, like your post, your f- subscribers. And then there is the, uh, what we are building uh, on the peripheral, like uh, the API engine and then other stuff that we're still planning out. It, I imagine like starting a, a whole different uh, social platform, because a lot of this has to do with human behavior, right? You have to really understand uh, what makes people tick, what makes people like be engaged. I mean, I imagine it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult, um, tall order, but I, I love the fact that you're tackling this because, you know, right now we have, you know, before social media, we didn't have anything. And then, you know, we had a few years where people have learned how to, uh, you know, behave and, you know, uh, think when it comes to these social platforms. And then we had these online dating platforms, right? Where at first it was kind of like considered like almost like desperate. And then everybody was very much, you know, felt like it was normal to, you know, swipe right or left, you know, how do you get to a place where this type of platform is the norm? Like, is it an educational aspect? Is it more from like a user experience standpoint? Like what's like the main uh, catalyst for creating this kind of adoption? Yeah. Like what, why would you like, why would you choose a different social platform? Do do you have a, do you have like, is, is there a reason why you might want to migrate to a different platform? If I'm not satisfied with my existing platform, then I think that opens up the door for, okay, what are my other options? Right. I I wonder if, you know, when you talk about monetization, right, people monetizing, people automatically think, okay, you know, YouTube, you can monetize that. And, And maybe they don't understand that they're only collecting, like you said, 30% of the revenue, right? Yep. And, and there's an opportunity to, to kind of, quote unquote, cut out the middleman, right? Which is essentially what blockchain technology does uh, through the use of smart contracts. So is it is it just a matter of education to help them understand that? Or what do you think is going to take for that mass adoption? Yeah, yeah, I think your, your, your answer to that kind of also is, is, is what, what I was trying to, uh, trying to answer. Really, we, want, we have to find a product market fit where that's something like you can't just say, oh, because there's a mistrust among Twitter or Facebook that people are just going to stop using it. But more like there is something missing and this new platform is actually providing and that's more concrete than just like trust maybe it could be like you can't just put a decentralized anything to to work right you can just say oh this is a decentralized uber and let's use this different uber or like this is a decentralized twitter a, a twitter clone that lives on blockchain and then we can all just use it. it it fundamentally has to solve something and the way we are seeing it uh cyber can only provides the infrastructure layer and finding the product market fit on the product lab level or like a, a, a more customer like accessible level um is what we've seen um either going through some niches that only the crypto community is uh is like focusing on the crypto community the crypto tweets or like those content can be a strong 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 influence to have people migrate off of existing platforms and then like take then take off from those niches to other areas where uh uh we, we get more um, recognition, but then another route would be, as you said, like monetization, like we've tested this before with my last company, as well as a lot of uh, monetization models are, are enabled naturally by tokenization, like a lot of NFT communities, a lot of like, those governance model or, or just in general, like uh, sponsorships on, on Gitcoin. Like there are various ways that crypto already enabled monetization and if we can help creators specifically do that um, and, and do it better than what Web2 what, what companies are doing, then that could be a catalyst to uh, wider adoption. 
And yeah, just to add on, like on top of CyberConnect, we did build our own product that's called Link3. So Link3 is a Web3 native social network that's like a link, LinkedIn plus um, Eventbrite, where you, it's, or, or like Facebook profile, Facebook pages plus Facebook events back, back, back in the days when they were still early. Uh, so you, everybody can sign up, especially specifically for the crypto users. They can sign up for a profile where their wallet is acquiring a CC profile under under the hood, and they they can start linking up their crypto experiences, their crypto assets, um, their organization, what they've contributed to. Like very crypto focused group of people display their experience or the most likely professional experience. So if you visit link three dot two slash Ryan, you'll be able to see everything that I've done before. Also, and my podcast before, I'll put this interview as well on there. So it's like a more a, a really crypto focused uh, group of people. And then for organizations, so if you go to link three dot two slash cyberconnect, you can see the organization profile. And organ organizations can sign create Web three events, which is like AMA, Discord, uh, Discord channels to uh, encourage people to organize those uh, events where you want people to sign up for uh, joining a Twitter space or AMA, and then based on whether they are, uh, based on some requirements, like they, if they stay at least like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you can get a, distribute them a proof of uh, uh, participation or what we call West token that's inside the CyberConnect kind of protocol. Um, in that way, Link3 kind of becomes a platform for uh, a lot of the, uh, so we have more than 1400 organizations on Link3 that, that's using uh, the, 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 the organization profile as well as the, the event hosting feature. And they can always uh, target those group of uh, Web3 users who are looking for new projects or new uh, opportunities to contribute. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of our approach to how to build something that's unique and fits a specific need. That's that's interesting uh, in regards to uh, Link Three. So I'm assuming these mainstream social media platforms like Twitter, like Discord, um, they have, I guess, uh, you can utilize like specific APIs, right, to integrate yep. with them, and then that way you're able to essentially. The, the two platforms are able, able to communicate with each other. Is that correct? Yeah, let's, let, I can walk you through like a specific example for it. Yeah. So one, one of the biggest use cases for Link3 is hosting AMAs or events. Mm -hmm. Normally, like we, you would be hosting an uh, AMA on Twitter space where you want, you, you, like, you, can, you can only let, let your uh, Twitter followers kind of know that. And if they set up like a reminder or if you, they see like you have a scheduled upcoming space, they can set a reminder themselves. Or if you're actually in the MA, they can come join. But then there is no a way of uh, first like giving them the opportunity to sign up ahead, ahead of time. There's no way for them to uh, show that they actually were part of this MA or like they actually came or not. And there is no way of the organizers to show appreciation directly like, oh, I can kind of recognize these people are early in my like early community calls or in my product updates calls or, or just like normal MAs. So all of this like Twitter uh, related data are only on Twitter. Like there's no way of, I want to drop an NFT to all the people who actually came to my Twitter space. Mm -hmm. So we kind of integrate that into the Link3 product where users sign up like RSVP on Link3 and by linking up their Twitter with their address. Um, during the AMA, during the Twitter space, our, our, our bot will observe whether those people actually showed up, whoever they signed, like whoever that signed up, did they ever show up? And if they did, uh, they can come and claim that they were part of it. So that that's how uh, we're leveraging those, those APIs and also like providing extra functionality to the organizers. Like organizers, all, like sometimes they always have this uh, um, uh, demand of trying to issue NFTs or trying to reach those wallet addresses, not only just on the Twitter, like Twitter account level. Okay. So it, so it sounds like, you know, Twitter, which is considered to already be somewhat of a, you know, crypto centric platform, but you're taking it a step further by really 
targeting these crypto communities and you can do things like rewarding participants with an NFT or uh, you can just really be more target specific because everybody on this platform, Link3 is, you know, has an idea of what crypto is. So if you're hosting like Twitter spaces, for instance, and they're uh, revolved around uh, blockchain technology, then you can leverage Link3 to kind of target that audience a little bit better. Yes, yes. Uh, like right, right now, if you go on Link3, there's probably a couple, probably 200 events that's scheduled for the upcoming week or month. And users can, can just look through all these different events that's going to happen eventually on Twitter or on Discord, but they, they can browse like what kind of organization they're interested in, what kind of topic they're interested in. And they can just RSVP through that. And organizations have a better view of, oh, these are the demographic. Like uh, all my audience that actually came are ape holders or they're punk holder or, or they're interested in like knowing more on like uh, Arbitrum because their on-chain data shows that they are playing around with Arbitrum and stuff, right? Like uh, you get more dimension than just the Twitter because Twitter is only on the traditional social side, not really on the uh, Web3 interoperable data side. Like there is no way for people to link up a, a wallet to a Twitter. But yeah, there, uh, Link3 is a product that we built uh, first to solve a problem that we see in the, in those communities where they are having a hard time trying to organize those events and, uh, and having a channel to distribute those events as well as those functionality, as you said, like the rewards and stuff. Uh, at the same time, all the Link3 data are written on CyberCon protocol. So now uh, we are opening up this opportunity for people to build. Like we are really welcoming people to build into this ecosystem and leveraging those data. We already have 130,000 profile holders, CyberConnect profile holders. And we have, uh, as I said, 1,400 organizations already using Link3. So all these data, uh, all these past experience like past history of users in interacting with, with, with these organizations and, and, and link three events can be leveraged to build other social platforms. That's, it could be a content specific platform. Like I can, uh, someone can build a, a Twitter clone or someone can build like a community, a DAO community tooling that, that based around users history of uh, interacting with those organizations on link three, because every, all the data lives on the a shared data layer. And yeah, speaking of that, we are actually hosting a hackathon right now. That's uh, that's going from February the seventh to March the thirteenth, where we invite uh, a lot of developers to build on top. Currently, we have like about about fifty to sixty developers that's uh, actively building, and users can expect some new product coming out of a uh, cyber kind of ecosystem after the hackathon ends. So not only Link Three is the only product like. Link3 will not be the only product that lives on CyberConnect. And uh, I'm assuming you're going to post these updates on the CyberConnect Twitter profile. Yes, yes please follow. Please follow up on on on, uh, uh, on CyberConnect's uh, Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. I'll make sure to uh, to include the links in the description. Uh, question for you, Ryan. So you know, Elon Musk tends is. A, He's kind of like crypto, very volatile, right? In his thought process. Is there a scenario where let's say tomorrow he says, you know what, you know, we don't want these integrations to be available anymore. And, you know, what would happen to say, you know, Link3 if um, that was to uh, transpire? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And we are actually seeing a lot of restriction from uh, Twitter APIs all the time. And that's why, one of the reasons why we are building a universal accessible layer, right? Like, as I said, if Twitter is entirely built on top of a decentralized social graph protocol, that there wouldn't be anything like API restriction or censorship. Uh, everybody's seeing, like, if they're building anything related to Twitter, they're seeing, like, restriction on their API all the time. Um, there is little we can do if they shut down the entire API. Probably a lot of the products in on on, on uh, that's in Twitter in, in crypto space that involves Twitter are not going to be able to operate if they shut down the API. However, I think that could create better, uh, more potential for people to build on a shared data layer. That's uh, what we're CyberConnect is building. 
so already people can like people can build an entire Twitter clone on top of CyberConnect, where the data all lives on chain and lives in a public accessible place. Play play along with me in this scenario. Let's say I am a very negative person, to say the least. I'm putting out a lot of bad information, um, information that if I was on Twitter or other platforms, like most likely it would get me banned. Okay. But because link three is decentralized, I don't really have any fear. So I'm just letting all out, right. I'm putting all that information out there from your, from your like humble opinion. Um, what, what do you do in that scenario? Is it, because it is decentralized, like, do you allow me to express myself in whatever way I, I want to? Or do you step in and provide some kind of um, restrictions there? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think content moderation is always the one of the hardest problem or for any content focus or social media type of platforms. The protocol itself is really enabling more possibilities like data, like data interoperable kind of uh, a design space, but not like uh, encouraging people to leave uh, just very negative or, 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 or just wrong, like false facts in, in, in a decentralized way. Like moderation happens on a per layer that like the protocol itself is really providing the data accessible, but not caring about the content itself. But applications built on top have the responsibility of doing content moderation because the, the platforms are actually still abiding to uh, the, the local laws, right? It's, it's like Uniswap as a protocol, it lives on a like universally accessible Ethereum network, but then Uni, Uniswap or a lot of these uh, DEXs, their trading application or the front ends are still uh, under uh, the same laws that governs other centralized exchanges, if that makes sense. So yeah. it's on a different layer. And we still got we still got to do all we were doing in Web two to prevent contents from being just terribly wrong. Right. So it sounds like what you're saying is you're providing a more decentralized option, but at the same time, not so decentralized to where it's a animal that's like out of control, got a mind of its own. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Tech, tech, like technological, like advancement only provides op optionality, it's, it, it, but those optionality still has to live in, uh, the same, the same space that like the governance every, like every other platform. So you can't, you can't just build a, a platform where right? right? Like everything is, is, is false or everything is negative. Uh, that that's not providing any value. Yeah, I mean, I think that in some business models, it absolutely makes sense to kind of draw the line. You know, I come from a security world and when I work with a lot of clients, you know, one of the most common vulnerabilities that we come across is centralization. And yeah. that's because, you know, a, a lot of projects, the way they're designed, they're not designed to be 100% fully decentralized. Although I think there are some you know, great, great use cases where you, where you need that. But I think that, uh, in some cases, I guess, in order to fulfill their business model, there's certain privileges, you can't just like renounce to a DAO. Right. Um, and so, um, I, I like the approach also because in order for us to transition into more of like a web three model, you can't just go like zero to a hundred, right? You kind of yeah. have to take it like step by step. Um, and so yeah. it sounds like you're, you're, you're transitioning people from where we are currently to this, you know, one step at a time, um, which is, you know, the ability to, you know, maintain sovereignty, the ability to monetize your, your data, uh, and all these other things that you talked about in regards to link three. So, um, I'll make sure to include the links in the description. Ryan, it was a real pleasure to uh, to talk with you. Any uh, any parting thoughts for the listeners? Um, yeah, I think one thing is for all the listeners. I think it's now is the best time to really get involved in Web three social. 
because the as I said, like a lot of the, the timings are pointing to this uh, this year or the coming year to uh, be the prime for for a lot of the Web three social protocols and as well as like, a lot of different experiments. Uh, just be sure to check check out what we're building here at CyberConnect, as well as all the uh, projects that's going to ship on top of CyberConnect. So you can have an experience directly interacting with those products. Or if you're a builder, yeah, please consider inter- uh, incorporating some of the uh, universal social graph that we are providing to your product. And yeah, th- thanks again for, for, for this opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on, Ryan. And I'll, I'll be sure to also include the video in Network Spotlight. And uh, yeah, it was a real pleasure to chat.